Hi, my name's Mike Minnis, and I'm the campus pastor for Northwood Church in Wiggins, Mississippi. Let's be honest today. Most of us would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, or I'm kind of a Christian. But what does that really mean anyway? Honestly, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about being a Christian. It actually speaks more about being a disciple or a follower of Jesus. But what does a disciple do? Well, a disciple befriends tax collectors, offends Pharisees, goes out of his way and helps those in need. If you want to live like Jesus lived, you have to love like Jesus loved. We'll show you how he loved and how he lived in this series called Disciple. I want to take just a, just a quick moment to honor Pastor Van. Now, uh, my name is Mike. I'm the campus pastor at the Wiggins campus uh, right up the road. Pastor Van is actually there preaching today, and, and uh, I am just totally honored to be uh, allowed to speak in his, in his pulpit and on this stage today. Pastor Van has paid the cost. He's paid the price over the years, and God has honored that. And the cool thing is that he didn't just keep all the credit. He's just willing to give it away to guys that he works with and, and pour his life into other uh, men and women. And, and, and I know you love him. I love him. He's my spiritual father. So can we just give it honor right now to Pastor Van? Come on. Well, we are in a series called Disciple. And uh, we learned first week that uh, a disciple really is someone who's a student, a follower, someone who hears and learns and then puts into action those things which we've learned, right? And so we are disciples. Last week, we realized that we don't have what it takes to be a disciple. We need something more. We need that missing piece of the puzzle, which is the Holy Spirit of God. I really believe this. This is, this is something that I've lived. I believe this is true, that we, we cannot be, we will not be the disciple that Jesus intends unless we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need that power, that, that extra oomph. Otherwise, we're, just, we're really just falling short. We're spinning our wheels. And today, I want to talk to you about the cost of being a disciple. Now, let me ask you a trick question. This is a trick question, so go for it, right? You just go for it. Nothing to lose here. How many of you would, would like to become more mature? As a matter of fact, how many of you would like to be whole and complete before God today? Come on, just wave at me. Some of you are just scared to pieces because I said it's a trick question. I would say in our hearts, whether we raise our hands or not, that we would all like to be whole and complete, mature before God. I believe that. You know, uh, I was saved around 23 years ago. Uh, I had uh, grown up in church, knew a lot about church lingo, knew all the Bible characters, right? And I, uh, I straight away went out and did my own thing for many years, and then God got a hook in me, and he, he reeled me in. And I thank my mom for that. She was one of the key players praying me into uh, God back in the day. Got saved 23 years ago, and my conversion was um, one of those unique conversions that probably most of you have heard about. Uh, unlike most people, most people get saved, you know, and wasn't a lot of fireworks, wasn't a lot of fanfare, and it took a lot of work, right? And, and, and the years have passed, you're still working hard. You know, and my, my conversion was a little different than that. It was, a, it was a black and white conversion. I mean, it was a going from dark to light. It was just a switch was thrown, and I was different. Man, I was totally different. Um, radically saved, and I bought in hook, line, and sinker, and, and just, I, in, I involved myself, I dove into the Bible. <laughs> I literally read the Bible six times through in a year, my first year getting saved. I was so hungry for truth, and I don't know why, I can't explain that, and I haven't talked to many people in, in the world that, uh, that have had that same experience. You know, it's very unusual. Uh, I'm an unusual person, I guess you would say. <laughs> Some of you would say, yep, that's weird, but... <laughs> 
I jumped in and I, I remember reading scriptures uh, like in the book of Romans that says you will share, you must share in the suffering of Christ. And I remember reading the book of Hebrews where it said that God as a father loves us as his children, and because he loves us as his children, he as his children, he disciplines us as his children. And then I remember reading in the book of James and believing this that that we're to count it all joy when tr- trouble and suffering comes our way, when trials come our way. We're to count it all joy because because when we when we have these experiences, trouble and and suffering that come our way, it it causes us to grow in maturity. It makes us whole and complete. That's the trick question part, you know. So, so I realized way back 23 years ago that if I'm going to grow, then I've got to face some suffering. If I'm going to change, then I've got to have some hard times in life. And, and, and I, honestly, over the last 23 years, through the ups and the downs, I've always given God credit for that. I've just, you know, said, hey, God, thanks for the good times. But when the bad times have come, I said, hey, God, thanks for the bad times. Because you trust me enough to bring suffering in my life or allow suffering to allow me to grow and mature and become complete. Now, he may have started way early on me because he's got a lot more work to do. I don't know. But he, he has. He's worked really hard through my life. And, you know, I, I, I just, you know, even when things break around the house, you know, instead of saying, oh, what am I going to do? Immediately, I remember the scriptures and I say, Lord, you know, something broke. It's yours. I gave it to you a long time ago. You got to fix it. And he has. He has. And so suffering is part of life. We, we grow through our suffering. There's a very popular uh, Christian song that's been sung for many, many years. And I believe probably most of you have heard this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want you to help me out here. Just a little play along, right? I'm going to sing the first part of the sentence, and I want you to complete this for me. And I want you to sing because I don't want to be the only bad singer on the, on the, uh, on the day, right? When, when it's all down. Um, I have decided. Y'all know it. Y'all know the song. Y'all know the song. Hey, all right. I was hoping, man, I didn't throw that out there and it just didn't land, you know. Y'all know the song. This song is a very popular song, right? Sung throughout generations. And this song was written based on the story of of a man who lived in northern India many years ago. And he converted to Christianity. And when he converted to Christianity, it was not accepted in his community. He was the lone guy out there. And uh, a Welsh missionary had come through, preached Jesus and, and the gospel, and the guy got saved, and nobody else was saved. So they, they persecuted him, and they turned him in to, the, to the, the tribal leader, right, the chief of the tribe there in the community. And the tribal leader came, and he said, you're going to have to renounce Jesus. We can't accept that here. And, and, and his words were, I have decided <clears throat> to follow Jesus. And the tribal chief told him, he said, well, if you're going to stick to that, then we're going to arrest you. We're going to put you in jail, and, and, and it's not going to be pretty for you. And, and he said this. He said, though no one joins me. Yeah, some of you went to churches where they didn't sing that verse. but <laughs> <clears throat> Though no one joins me, still I will follow. I'm not turning back, you know, I'm not turning back. I'm going to stick this thing out. And sure enough, they arrested him, and they arrested his wife and his children, and they threw them all in jail, and, and they, they executed them. And, and on, his, on his deathbed, before he was executed there, his one last words were, The cross before me, no turning back. You know, being a disciple of Jesus is going to cost you. Thousands of people gave their life in 2013 alone for the sake of Jesus. And we don't see a lot of persecution in our life to the, to the magnitude of death like we hear about around the world. But we still face struggling and suffering and hard times in our life. And it's all by God's design. He allows it. Some of you in this room right now are going through tremendously hard times. You're crying out in the middle of the night. You're literally crying tears. Your emotions are a wreck. You're you're actually, your mind is racing. You're you're physically struggling because of what's happening in your life. And, And yet God allows these things in the Christian's life. He could stop it. He could change everything. But he doesn't. He allows it in our lives. Because he knows that by going through these struggles and hard times, emotionally, mentally, physical, hard times, relationships that have gone bad, many times financially, by going through these times, we grow in our maturity. So often we run from God when we hit hard times instead of running to God. But he has the answer. 
So I want to give you just a couple of minutes this morning of, of what it looks like. What it looks like to be a disciple who counts the cost. Can we go there? Can we go there? Are you giving me permission to go there in your life? Come on. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, help us today to see the bigger picture, to see past ourselves, to see God into the realm that you view from. God, I pray for every man and woman, every young person in this room today. God, that when we're done today, that we'll have some work to do tomorrow. That when we're done today, that God, that we'll realize what this is really all about. And God, whether we're in good times or bad times right now, we'll realize, God, that we are, as Christians, if we're believers, we're in the hands of a mighty God. And there's nothing to be afraid of, God. We give you our time right now, Holy Spirit, and we ask you to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Salvation will cost you something. It costs you your life. It costs you everything to be a disciple. You know, salvation does occur in a moment. In a moment of time when we say yes to Jesus, we're saved. But discipleship is a process that takes a lifetime. Martin Luther, a renowned theologian years ago, said, A religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. It's got to cost us something. I like to say it, it requires that we put some skin in the game to be a disciple. So let me give you three, three aspects of the cost of discipleship. If you're a note taker, number one is that we must make Jesus the Lord of our lives. We must make Jesus the Lord of our lives. Somebody say Lord. Lord. The Lord of our lives. Now this means that Jesus has to become the boss. It means he has to become the supreme ruler of our lives. It means that he has to become number one. And so often, so often, and, and I see this all the time with people, we want to add Jesus to our life. We want to take Jesus, and we'll say yes to Jesus, and we want to put him in our pocket. We tuck him in our pocket, we're like, I got Jesus. You got Jesus? I got Jesus. Here he is, right here in my pocket, you know. We got Jesus. Come on, let's sing to Jesus. And we sing to Jesus, and, and then when it's convenient, we go to the Jesus card, and we say, I got Jesus, and, and praise the Lord. And you know, when it's not convenient, he just stays in the old back pocket, right? We just, you know. He's there. We know he's there, but there's no relationship. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I don't play that. Jesus wants to become the Lord of your life. The Lord of your life. All in. In the Bible, throughout the Bible, uh, the relationship we have with God is paralleled to a marriage, what a marriage should be. Jesus uses that. God uses that in the Bible to help us to see. We need pictures, right? We need to see it, to believe it. And so, you know, he uses marriage throughout the Bible. And marriage, in a marriage, think about this, ladies. Come on. Think about this, ladies. How many of you at your, at your, at your wedding day, right? Your wedding day, and you're standing there in the front. The, the, the old preacher man's there, and he says, you know, to have and to hold this and to that and all those things. And, and, and he says, you know, to the, to the man, to you, and he says, yep, I'm going to give you 98% of me. Come on, ladies. How many of you would say, that's great. 98% is good. You ought to see what I have now. No, don't, don't answer that. You know? <laughs> no, no. You'd be crazy to say 98% was okay. Right. Amen. You want 100%. So does anybody want 100%? Amen. We want 100%. Well, why would we think? Why would we think in this relationship that we have with God, this covenant relationship, that, that we could just put him in our back pocket, you know, give him, you know, give him 50% of our life? Or oh, the real good Christian, 75%. Why do we think that we can do that? Why do we think that we can just make Jesus an appendage of our life, add him to our life? Sometimes we do. But Jesus says, I want all or nothing. 100% commitment. He wants to become the Lord of your life. And you miss this step. If you miss this step, nothing else makes sense anymore. Nothing else in Christianity makes sense when you don't make him Lord of your life. Because then you begin to blame God. Why haven't you fixed this, God? Why are you leaving me here, God? I don't understand, God. And you just begin to blame God and you get mad at God and you turn on God. And many have. Many have come before you and have turned on God. Because they didn't understand that God wants to be the Lord of your life. To have your whole heart. And that's not easy. That is not easy. It costs you everything. But when we make God the Lord of our lives, we can move on to step two. We can move on to carrying our own cross. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus carried his cross and then he turns to us and he says, now I want you to carry your cross. 
You see now, there's all, all of a sudden it's like, okay, he's the Lord of my life. What's first, Lord? What's first? Are we going to have fun? Are we going to go out there and just, you know, we're going we're gonna to raid the world with Jesus, God. We're going to go with our megaphones to the street corners and we're going to bring him in, Lord. The harvest is ripe. And, you know, here we go, Lord. Or we're going we're gonna to bring him to the job or the classroom. We're going to go. We're going to go. Yoo-hoo! We're going to have fun, God. What's the first thing you want me to do, God? And pick up your cross. Pick up your cross. Well, Lord, you already did that, right? He said, I did my cross. You got to get your cross. You got to pick up your cross, or you're not my disciple. You, in other words, you don't get it. You don't understand. If you don't pick up your cross, you'll never understand. We pick up our cross in the in the time of Christ that He walked the earth. The cross was a form of execution. It was a form of humiliation, a form of ridicule. And yet Jesus turns to us as his believers, his followers, his disciples, and he says, I want you to go there. I want you to go to that place of execution. I want you to go to that place of ridicule. I want you to go to that place. God knows us so well, and he knows that we're drawn to lust, and we're drawn to greed, we're drawn to pride. Every one of us left alone falls into lust, falls into greed, falls into pride. We want it our way. We want it now. It's all about me. And God knows that. And he knows that you'll never be fully mature. You'll never be whole and complete, left to yourself, left to this place of, of lust, pride, and greed. He knows that, that, that we cannot, we cannot, we don't have the ability to wrestle those three, those three to the ground and beat them, lust, pride, and greed. He knows that. And so he says, pick up your cross. The solution to self, to flesh, to lust, pride, and greed is the cross. Pick up your cross. It's painful. But when crucified, when we are crucified, our lust, our pride, our greed is crucified, all of a sudden we become mature and we're actually useful as a disciple to our Lord. So he says, pick up your cross. There's a couple of ways to do that. Number one is self-denial. It's not easy. Hey, listen, it's a a work in project. Self-denial. Deny those things that are temporarily pleasurable but eternally destructive and painful. We, de- we deny the desires of our flesh for lust and for pride. We deny the temptation to sin. We refuse to settle for less than God's best for our lives. Self-denial. Second way is torture. Who? Nobody likes that word. You're going to get home today eating, eating Mother's Day dinner and be like, did that guy talk about torture in church today? What's up with that? Torture. Any great achievement requires torture. Athletes torture themselves. Thinkers torture their minds. It's, it's a healthy level of, of, of tension. I heard a guy once say that uh, tension is healthy in our lives. Too much tension is not good because, you know, it can cause us to snap. Too little tension is not healthy in our lives. And he referred to the belt on the front of your automobile. If there wasn't enough tension, it would just fall off. It would be useless. So not enough tension in our life is not healthy. But the right amount of tension is healthy in our lives. And when we talk about torture, we're talking about tension in our lives. We need a healthy level of tension in our lives because it, it lets us know, it lets us know that we are dependent on God. We are dependent on our Lord. We must suffer temporary pain for eternal gain in our lives. When I think through Walking with God over the years, I, I remember, and, and, and this, this may help you out a little bit, but I remember, and it makes more sense now, 23 years later, but in the heat of the moment, when, when things aren't going well, when suffering is right there upon us, and when it was in my life, I didn't see this, this principle. I didn't see this in the moment. It wasn't until after the moment, after the clouds had cleared, after the smoke had cleared, when you look back and you go, you know what, I see right there what God was doing in my life. I see right there what God was trying to accomplish through me. He was trying to help me to defeat the flesh. I see that now, but, but in the heat of the moment, you can't see. Amen. I do remember, I do remember all those people in my life when I was going through trouble that would encourage me and say, you're going to make it. Kind of like, like probably I'm doing here today to you. You're going to make it. Hey, hang in there. You're going to make it. Torture, struggle, strive. You're going to make it. Come on, come on, don't quit. My daughter had twin uh, girls uh, 10 months ago, and they're, they're at that stage where they're beginning to walk, right? And, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you sit there, and you, 
You stand them up, you back up a little bit, come on, you're going to make it, come on, you know, and they're excited and they're, they're really weird looking because they're just bobbling around, you know, and that's exactly how you look when you go through struggles, by the way. <laughs> you're like, you know, and then it's that one step, and, and Andrea, she, she took a step the other day, and we're like, woohoo, we're so excited, and, you know, and I, I believe God, Daddy God, he does that with us, you know, he's like, you know, Casey took a step, woo, look at him, he's, he's getting it, he's getting it, and then just recently she took, took three steps, and then this weekend she took five steps I mean it was not pretty it wasn't but it was five steps and and we're all excited come on yes you know we look like more fools than her we ah, you know jump dancing around and you know God's cheering us on and there's people around you in your life that's why we need the church cheering you on saying you're gonna make it through this but you know what torture is necessary in a healthy sense of the word healthy tension is necessary and then as we're carrying our cross death is a must now, let me explain that. Uh, I remember reading years ago that in another country on the other side of the world that they literally took crosses and nailed themselves to a cross. And I read about a guy who, who tried to do it to himself all alone one day, and he got his first hand nailed down, and he realized, uh-oh. Not sure if that's a true story or not. You must die to yourself daily by allowing the trials and circumstances of life to help you become more like Christ. That's how we die to self. The pain of insults, of rejection, of disappointments. So for some of you, the pain of physical sufferings, ridicule, some of you in your marriage, some of you on the job, failures, injustices. Anybody here ever suffered an injustice in life? And you probably, like me, walked away from it and went, that's not fair. Well, who cares? It wasn't fair. God will leverage it, though. But, you know, we die to self. We look for these opportunities. My wife and I, my wife and I have been married 21 years. Thursday was our anniversary, and Angela uh, has been a trooper all along through my sufferings, through my struggles, and even on her own, had her own. Then we've had some of us couples, and some of you couples, you know what I mean. We've, uh, we've pressed through, and, and over the years, Angela has always said, and, and, and this has been a great encouragement to me, but conflict is an opportunity for growth. And, and that, just that sentence, that phrase has encouraged me, but it's so true. Conflict is an opportunity for death, and death brings growth. Jesus told us that if we're, and we use the, the term wheat, and a grain of wheat, and he says unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it won't produce fruit. It's got to fall to the ground and die to produce fruit. And in our lives, we must, we must be willing to die to produce fruit which is God's ultimate desire, which is a sign of maturity, a mark of wholeness and completion. We must be willing to die to self. I told you there was three things. If you're a note taker, that third thing is give everything to Jesus. Give everything to Jesus. Our whole relationship with God is based on trust. And we use the word faith. Faith gets you connected to God. And we have a life of faith. Everything about being a believer is, is on faith, right? But our intimate personal relationship with God is built on trust. We are learning. You and I are learning to trust in Jesus, right? But don't be surprised the fact that God is learning to trust you. He, he, he does. He's looking. He's saying, can I trust you? I wonder sometimes if he doesn't say, why do you think I should trust you? You know, you know you. He knows you. Why would he trust you? But he he says, hey, I want to learn to trust you. And so he gives us these opportunities. He gives us plenty of opportunities in life to earn his trust, to prove our trustworthiness. But everything, everything in this relationship with God is based on trust. You, you You don't honor him and obey him. He says, I can't trust you. Why would he bless you if he can't trust you? Why would he? Why would he invest in you if he can't trust you? Now, I do believe this about our God. I believe he looks into our potential. He looks at what we can be, will be one day as we're being perfected. I do believe that. I don't don't believe God looks at us like people look at us and go, I'm out. (laughs) I don't believe that. I believe he's in. But it's all built on trust. Luke chapter 14, verse 28 says, but don't begin. Don't begin this life of being a disciple until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. This is God. He's looking out for us. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. 
Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Watch this. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything. Somebody say everything. Everything Everything you own. You have to give everything to Jesus because it's a trust relationship. Disciples give Jesus control over their futures. You know, we have plans. Some of you, some of you have plans. Some of you don't have plans at all. But some of you have plans for our futures. We know what we want to be. We know what we want to do. We don't want to have. And when we come to Christ, this trust relationship that we have, God says, now I want you to give all that to me. And there are some things that he gives back to us. Some dreams and passions and desires he gives back to us. Some that he doesn't. Some, sometimes he gives us things we didn't expect. Some things that we didn't realize we had in us to accomplish. But he gives us these tasks. He gives us these these works, these responsibilities in this trust relationship. But disciples give Jesus control over everything. Proverbs 16, 9 says, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. You can plan all day, but when you give it to Jesus and you exchange it back, He's the one ultimately is the one who determines our steps. Disciples give Jesus control over their finances. This can be a definite uh, touchy subject in the church. But I want to tell you this. I want to tell you, I'm a full believer in Giving Jesus full control over finances. And I have worked 23 years now as a Christian to prove that this principle works. And I'm today convinced 100%. You can't convince me otherwise. But God says, I want your money. I want all of you, right? Which includes your money. (laughs) And sometimes we resist in that area. Sometimes we're like, oh, wait a minute now, God. You know what? I'm giving you my Sundays and I'm reading the Bible and praying. I'm going to be a witness every now and then. But you start messing with my money, God. Think, Hey, we got issues, right? You got issues, right? He says, no, no, I want all of you or none. Are you in or out? Wow. So he wants our money. He wants us to trust him. There's a scripture that tells us where our money is, there our heart is also. And You know, where our money is lies our allegiance. There's a good question that arises out of this. Do I really trust Jesus that much? Do I trust him with my money? And then there's this whole idea of delineating between Jesus and the church, which is impossible to do when you read the Bible. The church is the body of Christ, so you can't delineate. But we do. We rationalize in our mind. We delineate between Jesus and the church. This side's Jesus, this side's church. So, yeah, Jesus, I give you all my money. Church, you better back away. That's what we do. You give back. You know that preacher man, you want all my money? Raking it in? Yeah. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. It's not about the church or the preacher. This is about trust. This is about allegiance. And God says, I want, I want you to give me all everything. He doesn't rake all your money in and leave you desolate. But for many of you here today, you, you haven't taken the step to trust God with your finances. And, I, and I'll tell you, this is, this is strictly my opinion, but you're at, a, you're at an impasse, a, a hurdle, that you won't grow as a disciple until you cross that line. Until you say, God, I'm all in, including my money. You're, you're, you're at a dead end, and you won't grow. And you want to experience maturity and health and wholeness like God intends until you cross this hurdle. But God says to give us, give him our money. You know, I remember years ago, it was time for the income tax to come in. You know, when you get the end of the year, you file, or beginning of the year, you file, and your tax check's coming, right? It was in the mail, I'm sure. And, uh... We had calculated our return, and it was a significant amount, a couple thousand dollars. That was a very significant amount, by the way, for us. And I remember uh, one day God, just still small voice, he spoke, and he said, I want you to give that to me. And I remember the wrestling match that we had that day. Man. Because you know, you, you know what you do, right? You, you start thinking about what you're going to spend that check on. And we weren't, we weren't going to be frivolous with it. We were going to pay down some, some bills and... And save a little bit, right? Put a little back, you know, so we could take the family on vacation. And we had good intentions, pure heart, right? But I remember him saying, I want you to give that to me. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact he told me who to give it to out there, some person. <clears throat> I mean, that was tough. So I got home, and I, I, I didn't want to tell my wife, <laughs> you know. And, and honestly, Angela has, she's, she's in that area, she has healthily submitted to me in, in all those times. But but one of our rule of thumbs is it, when God speaks to me about finances, he, he seems to always speak to her. We come together. And, and here in this case, it was the same. I said, 
Angela, I, I hate to say this, but God spoke to me, and he wants us to give our whole income tax return away. And, and she said, yeah, he told me to. <laughs> so, and, and, and so, wow, the check came in, and we went and cashed it, and we, took, and we did. We did what God said. And it was hard. It was really hard because the old flesh wants to hold on. But I'm telling you, the freedom that came afterwards, and honestly, the blessing that came afterwards, because our life has been a, a perpetual ride of blessing and giving, and it's, just, it's, 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 it's a great adventure, but, but it takes release in that area. It can become a roadblock or an impasse in your life. So we give our finances to Jesus, and disciples give Jesus control over their families. I remember early on with my children, just giving them to God. You know, even as a church, we do baby dedications on our first Wednesday services. And, and it's a symbolic event that helps us to just give our families to God. And, and, and that'll be tested. That'll be tested because sometimes your family gets sick. Or sometimes the family will do things that, that you don't agree with. And, and when you give your family to God, you can step back and say, God, okay, we're in this together. I gave my family to you. So what do I do now? How, how can I help you? How can you help me? How can we do this together in this trust relationship? How can we grow our family? How can we help to guide the family? But we give our family to God. With Jesus, being a disciple is all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Now I want to give you a couple of action steps just to walk away. It's tomorrow morning when you get up, um, you're going to go, man, that was a good message, but I can't do that. I can't do that. Yeah, that's what you're going to think. You know, it's really easy in this room right now to go, that's right. That's right, Pastor Mike. That's right. I need to do that. But tomorrow morning's a brand new day. So here's a couple of action steps. Number one is honestly examine your life. Galatians 6 tells us in verse 4 to pay careful attention to your own work. It goes on to say, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. If you don't ever stop and look at your life and say, how, how am I lining up with God? How am I lining up with the truth of the word? If you never do that, if you never examine your life, then you'll never really know what God has for you. You want to examine your life. Take a look at your life and say, you know what, God? What's my next step? For some of you in here, you've never really dedicated your life to Christ. You've never given your life fully to him. You, you know, you'll have an opportunity today to do that. For some of you, you gave your life to Christ, but you haven't invited him to be the Lord of your life, to take full control. And, and you know, you'll have an opportunity to do that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and all the days ahead of your life to give your full life to him. Second thing is, is to make necessary adjustments. You know, in the Bible, we read about all these guys that seem to be like superheroes. Noah, man, he built the ark that saved his family and saved the world, really saved. We're here today because of Noah. But Noah was just a regular guy. And if he hadn't let go of what he was doing to go build that boat, if he didn't make adjustments in his life, then the ark wouldn't have happened. You know, David was a shepherd and he became a king. But if he hadn't let go of the sheep... He would never have been a king. Some of you are thinking, that's not a huge trade-off right there, you know. But it was an action step. It was something necessary, an adjustment in his life. Peter, Andrew, James, John, these are guys that followed Christ through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And If they hadn't given up their fishing business and followed Jesus, then they wouldn't have accomplished the things they accomplished. And so my point is that we've all got to let go of something, make adjustments in our life to begin following Christ as a fully devoted follower. Sometimes that means significant changes, maybe in your lifestyle or your thinking or your commitments, your disciplines, your beliefs even. Sometimes it's significant changes. It's worth it. It's worth it. Lastly, is that we must be open to hear and obey God. When it's all said and done, whether it's this afternoon or tomorrow or one day later in the week, to stop and say, God, what do you think about my life? What do you say? And then to hear the one who loves you so desperately give you simple instruction and then to obey that. Really, really, that's the difference maker. To hear God and say, you know what, God? And some of you need to open your Bibles because he's going to speak to you through the Bible. You're going to be reading a scripture and all of a sudden that scripture is going to be <laughs> straight to your heart. It's going to change everything. And I challenge you today to be bold. Be ready. Be ready. This, this is what I believe. Because you've heard this message today, some of you may be watching it on TV or, or the live stream, but because you've heard this message today, now God is going to, he's going to step forward. He's going to come around the, the pulpit and he's going to stand facing you and he's going to say, okay, are you ready? Are you ready to live this great adventure? 
I believe that. I believe everybody in here is going to have the opportunity to take another step in your discipleship with God. Because you've heard this, now you're responsible. You're thinking, man, I wish I'd have skipped today. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Can we pray together right now? Could you get along with God right where you are? I just want to ask God's presence to help us today. Ask God's Holy Spirit to move in our individual lives today. God, we do thank you. God, we thank you for the truth. We thank you, God, for loving us so much that you work on us and you, you don't leave us alone. You don't leave us in our mess. God, you draw us forward through the good and the bad, God. Help us to learn. Come on, just ask him this right now. God, through the good and the bad, help me to learn to just trust you, to grow. Through the good and the bad, God, help me. Just forget anybody else that's here right now. God, through the good and the bad, help me to say yes, to respond properly. This is a big deal, y'all. Come on, God's here right now, and he's, he's looking at your heart. He's looking at your life and saying, are you willing to go with me? God, today I speak for me, and I'm sure there are many that would agree. Though none go with me, still I will follow. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, God. Whatever it looks like, Father, I'm going forward. With that, Father, we trust you. Come on, some of you have never said that. You might just take a moment and say, God, I trust you with my life, with my finances, with my family, with my future. Come on, nobody's looking around right now. Some of you came here today and you've never fully immersed your life into God. You've never said yes to God's goodness, His grace. And He wants to save you today. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up or come up front, but I'd love to pray with you right where you are. A simple prayer. You know, 23 years ago, somebody gave me some words that helped connect me to God. I'd love to do the same for you today. If that's you and you say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I know my life is separated from God. I've never made that, I've never pulled the trigger and said yes to God on that first step. But I'm ready to do that today. I'm ready for this new life. I'm ready for the change, whatever it takes. If that's you, I'd love to pray with you right where you are. All I want to ask you to do real quickly is simply lift your hand and put it right back down. Just shoot it up, put it right back down. Say, that's me. God bless you, sir. God bless you in the back right over here. Somebody else. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Somebody, you're just like, you know what? This is it. This is the day. This is it. No holding back. Anybody else? You say, you know what, Pastor Mike? Please include me in that prayer. That's me. God bless you, sir. Somebody else right over here. Yes. God bless you in the side. That's me. That's me. Come on, help us, Jesus, right now to say yes. Help us, Jesus, right now to say yes to the grace of salvation. Come on, if you raise your hands, I'm going to simply give you some words. I'm going to help you out. Maybe the rest of you guys who are in here today, as you pray, you could help us out with these words. But say something like this. Say, God in heaven. Come on, say it out of your mouths where your ears can hear it. God in heaven, please forgive me of my sins. I turn from them today, and I ask you to save me. Come live inside of me. Teach me to know you. Teach me to love you. I give you all of me, and I receive all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, can, can, we, can we look up this way? Yeah, give a shout out to Jesus. The decision to follow Jesus is just the beginning of your relationship with God. We know that it can be challenging to know what's next, so we'd love to help you with your next few steps towards a lasting relationship with God. If you go to northwood.tv connect and fill out our online connect card, we'll send you a free gift. It's a book called Fresh Start with God. Our lead pastor, Van Cody, also wants to send you a letter congratulating you on the decision you made and tell you about your next steps here at Northwood Church. These are no strings attached gifts, simply because we want to equip you with the tools you need to grow in God. We hope that this isn't your only look at Northwood Church. We'd love if you came to visit us on a Sunday morning at one of our locations. 
You can check out our website for service times and directions to one of our campuses. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do that online. Just go to northwood.tv slash give. You can give a one-time donation or you can sign up for our online community called MyNC and set up a recurring payment. Thanks again for joining us today and we'll see you next time.